So a few years ago, our, our you know, project or product, Satellite 6, which I'm working on, I had a task to write a Linux policy. So I volunteered. I have been sent to the SLinux training one week with the certification, and then I started coding. I took a trial and error approach, and it worked kind of. And over those three or four years, I've learned a lot of useful tips and tricks. Lots of these by myself and others, you know, by, you know, uh, putting questions on, on the SLinux guys. So I've, I've decided to, you know, do a talk uh, full of these tips and tricks. Uh, and before that, before we get to the tips and tricks, I'll do a very rough, you know, uh, you know overview of what SLinux is. It will be very simplified. Bear in mind that this will be only for us to get us on the same page. Uh, if you want to, you know, know more, search for Dan Walsh, S Linux, and you'll get what you need. Where we are not covering, you know, uh, deep things. Uh, we're not covering administration at all. Uh, I will focus, you know, on just very minimal, just to have uh, enough information to write a policy or something. This is also not a step-by-step -step tutorial on creating policies. It's, I would say, complementary. Uh, when I, when you search for uh, how to write a policy documentation. You find usually a documentation that gives you hello world, and this is rule, this is how it looks like, and then you are on your own. And I, I would like to complement that uh, and, and you know, provide you with some tips, uh, tips how to you know, improve your workflow. This is a lot of information about workflow. And, and yeah, let's go ahead. So SLinux is a module that enforces a policy. This is a nice definition. In other words, uh, this is what I like to say. It makes sure that programs do not misbehave. By misbehavior, I mean uh, you know, uh, working against set of rules. This set of rule can be pretty fine-grained. As Linux, you know, can do pretty well in this area. And here, is, this picture is coming from the wonderful coloring book. If you ha haven't, uh, if you have, don't have your own copy, go and grab it. We don't have uh, copies uh, here, uh, physically. Uh, those animals represent. Um, Linux processes, and we, for SLinux purposes, we need to tag, tag them somehow. Uh, for this, we use uh, SLinux types. Cat and dog are types, and you can think of a type as a string, as a constant or label, or something like that, that you assign to a process or resource. If you assign a tag, or if you have a, a type that is you know, reserved for tagging processes, we call it a domain type or domain. Uh, then we have some resources. Uh, the food here represents a resource that can be cl a, a class of file, directory, symlink, UDP, TCP port, a local socket. And those uh, types need to have, uh, those resources need to have uh, types as, uh, as well. So uh, as Linux leverages something called extended attributes for that in case of files. And for TCP and UDP port, you have a, a mapping list or table of um, port numbers and you know, assignments to types. And then we have, you know, writing a policy is really a, a writing a text file of uh, rules that, you know, give, that con con constrain an application. And they are, you know, you know uh, in a form of allow, that's a keyword. <coughs> then you have a source, a source of type, which is usually a domain. Then we have uh, the food represents the target type or destination, which is usually resource. Uh, and we have an action or, I would say, uh, uh, permission. And so in this case, as Linux observed that behavior, this is correct, uh, obviously. But in this case, uh, when uh, our doc represents a Linux process and the resource is maybe a configuration file somewhere, and the action and permission is open it for reading, that system call, uh, if the rule is not there, that system call, thanks to the SLinux, which will prevent that behavior, will end up with an error instead of file handle. So the system call will return error. This is important. SLinux can prevent misbehavior, can prevent from you know, errors or you know, bugs, uh, security bugs mostly. There's much more than that. We are, uh, we are at the end of my you know, explanation what SLinux is. We'll slightly touch uh, transitions then, but this is, this is you know, all I have for you. Uh, and so there's things like multi-tenancy, which is good for OpenShift. There, there's things like MLS, secret, top secret, confidential stuff, but we are not covering that. You can do just fine writing your own policies without you know, knowledge of what uh, MCS or MLS is. And I, I, I'm doing this every day, so I can tell you. So how can SLinux help? 
So first of all, I like this one. It prevents from you know, various attacks. Uh, we've, we've seen a nice talk about Shellshock. Uh, given a, a Git hosting service, which is you know, uh, enabled using uh, SSH, uh, Git over SSH, you have a, some kind of shell wrapper that you know, uh, constrain the user to uh, spawn a Git command and do stuff. If there's, that's a Shellshock vulnerable, uh, and if it, this is running confined, we say our application is running confined when SC Linux is enforcing the policy, then if your rules tells, tells something like, this application can only spawn Git, can only read Git configuration, and can only read data from slash service slash Git repos, if an attacker makes you know, uh, use of the shell shock and tries to spawn a shell, tries to spawn uh, anything, SC Linux will prevent from doing that. That's how it works. Although, SLNUX is not a golden hammer, of course. There are some other bugs, bugs and situations where it can't much help. For example, SQL injection. Web application talks to the database, and so we're using a TCP socket or something. For SLNUX, this is just a data flow, and it doesn't understand the data flow. So if, if instead of select, it's doing delete, SLNUX can't help you in this case. On the other hand, which I particularly like, is if you have a if you've taken a server offline and you're investigating stuff and your manager asks you, hey, okay, we have, we have a flaw in our, our application, that data was stolen, but was the ethical able to connect to a remote service that holds our more sensitive data? You can tell from your policy, yes or no, because if there was a rule, he could. If there's no rule, no, no chance. So it can help you even in you know, those worst situations we don't want to be in. More than that, it can help you find software bugs. Not many, many you know, uh, people know that uh, things like unchecked file open values, when, when a program doesn't you know, correctly uh, check for the handles, in the case of file is not, you know, can, can't be read or write, open for reading, writing, uh, it happens. And with, if you're doing uh, your policy writing, your, your workflow right, you find those bugs easily. Leak descriptors, another example, is great. Now, if you run Skype for some reason, or a third-party database system, and you don't have a source code with, uh, with, on, on your, in your hands, you can think to SC Linux, make sure this process won't you know, misbehave. Again, you can give it some rules, and it's surprising that some application, uh, if they can't find some, uh, if they can't read something, they still you know, keep running. So maybe you can, uh, you can create a, a policy that won't you know, enable Skype to read something, but it will still run. So it's a workaround. So let's have a look, let's have a look like uh, how SLinux policy look like in Fedora RHEL. So basically it's a, as I've said, kernel module of course, and then a set of tools and the policy itself. The policy is shipped in the SLinux dash policy package name. And the first one ships with, I think it's a meta package or it contains like configuration files. The one we are interested in is targeted. Targeted, the name stands for the variant or deployment type. And the target is the default one, which you end up uh, when you install Fedora well, and we'll be you know, focusing on the target in this talk. This package contains, uh, contains some um, things like file context definitions and the uh, policies themselves. They have an extension of PP. PP stands for Compiled Policy Module that you load into your S Linux, and uh, we'll be compiling them in a minute. Another interesting package is dash devil, which contains make files we'll be using in a minute. Interfaces and support types, which are very interesting. Nice knowledge base, I'll tell you later. And some um, administration uh, oriented things like uh, uh, manual pages and HTML documentation. Now, a policy is uh, just a bunch of three files. Basically, it works with the one file, but, but, uh, but for, for sake of completeness, let's take a look on the uh, three files. Type and enforcement file contains your rules. It's a text based, all are basic, basic text based. IF file has the same syntax, uh, we'll get in a minute, and it contains rules that which are to be con consumed by other policies. So it's a public interface, public API, I would say. And file context contains your default definition for file context. So to compile a module, you first need to have a policy module uh, macro in, in the TE file, otherwise it won't compi uh, compile. And then you call make, make file is coming from the devil sub package. Here's the first tip, if you do a symlink into your working directory, just type make. And the resulting file is pp, which, which you can load or list. 
as a module. Nice thing is that if you load a module, S Linux will remember that, not like just firewall command, which you need to provide with dash dash permanent to do this. So it will uh, remember. The make file contains a lot of in interesting stuff. Uh, the most used, I would say, for me, it was load, reload. So you can change your file, save, re reload, and it will automatically compile and reload your policy. Refresh is also nice when you want to start over, when you need to you know, reload everything from scratch. And there's several other variables which, which uh, have same defaults for us. We don't need to change them. So here is an example coming from the devil sub package. It's an example shipped with the S Linux policy devil sub package. And we'll, let's ta take a look on this. Uh, we'll cover the syntax in a minute. So after the policy module statement, you usually need uh, to declare your domain, which will be used for your application. In our case, this is type myapt. And we give it a domain type uh, using the domain type macro. Excuse me. Now, uh, I, I, haven't, uh, I, I missed uh, one particular thing, which is transition. You need to have some way to get into this domain, because if you start a process, it will, you know, uh, I think it will uh, inherit the parent's uh, mm, uh, domain. You need to have some kind of entry point. There are two basic types of mm, you know, software, I would say, I've been dealing with. Uh, coming from my experiences, and these are, you know, standalone binaries, you, you know, spawn and, and demons. And for standalone binary, you usually ex execute an executable file and that, you know, it loads up. And so for, for this type, uh, this is the example here, we need to, uh, the way you say, the way you change the domain, the, you, the way you get into your domain is that you define a helper, I would say, exec underscore t type, and you assign this type to executable file to your application. And once you, and you need to create a transition that tells basically that's the domain entry file a line that tells if an application is executed, uh, if an executable file labeled with this execT type is executed, then do a transition into my application domain, my app domain. Now. It looks scary, but trust me, uh, I've been doing pretty well without knowing all the details. I've never visited the domain entry file my interface. I don't know how it works, but you can do, you can copy this from, a, a, you know, other policy and where it changed, you know, uh, using a replace and it will work. The other case is when you are uh, writing policy for a, a daemon. Then you need a, a little bit different entry point when you need to deal with systemd and init script and you know, do the transition from there. But it doesn't matter. You can copy it and use it. W won't stop you from writing your first policy. And then we have some uh, file types for log, log files and TMP files. And then we have uh, the, our first rule, domain to read or append files which are tagged with my app log t. That's what the rule says, basically. It's no magic. We'll cover uh, in a minute other you know, forms. This is an example of the IF file. This is the same syntax. It's M4 language, or expanding, or macro language. I'll cover that in a minute. So let's keep the first one. It's a little bit more complicated. The second, my, my app read log file. This is how you define an interface that other people, other policy authors can consume. So in this case, if there is an up, other application that would need to read your logs, uh, without the rule, there is no way to read it. You need to add a rule for, to that application, and you can uh, create this API so other policy authors can you know, you know, have this rule and don't repeat, repeat themselves. We'll cover the syntax in a minute or so. An FC file stands for file context, and it's a basically three columns text file. The first one is, it's an old, not a shell glob, it's an, a regular, regular expression, so the I always you know, do a star instead of dot star there, so if, keep in mind this is a regular expression. The third, uh, second column uh, tells the, if you omit that, it will match for everything. Dash dash means file, dash d means di directory. And the third um, column, uh, again, we are not covering things like uh, users, roles, and M MLS, MCS stuff. That's the S0. All you need to know is that you can verbosely copy that from a different policy or from a, you know example file and change the desired type you want to set so in this case, user has been my apt will be, you know, um, when you do a restore con, it will be tagged as my apt my app exec t. So this is what we want. When we execute that file, it will, you know, do the transition, and our application will be running confined uh, under the my apt domain. Okay, 
So here's the first tip. The best knowledge base out there is usually uh, our SL, Red Hat S Linux team, or, uh, but before you contact them, uh, you can go ahead and search in the devil include in the, in the uh, devil sub package. You will find there a lot of interface files. Some of them are core, I would say, which resides in, uh, resides, reside in kernel and, and, and system, I think. And the others are from the contrib subdirectory. And those are policies for services and programs which ships with Fedora or RHEL. And the good thing about this is if you, if you learn how to navigate those interfaces, and I'll show you how in a minute, you, you have a nice knowledge base of the, the, the definition of the interfaces themselves, of course, so you can investigate what they do, but also a nice you know, a set of uh, usage. Uh, with uh, interfaces, you can find SPT files, which stands for support types. It has the same syntax, but they have different naming conventions, and we only have eight uh, SPT files in the modern Fedora distribution, while the IF files is almost 500. So when I first um, you know, ran into M4 many years ago, my first ever task when I was f signed in the Linux system for the, for the first time in my life, I tried to, to configure to reconfigure SendMail. And then that day I had to play with the auto tools and I have no idea what M4 is. I was like, what, what is this? this? This little quote it looks strange. But as Linux learned, you know, I had learned from S Linux that M4 is an eff efficient, small, nice language, and it works, uh, you know, easily. And you can learn it in a day. You don't need for S Linux. You only need to have, know like few uh, macros or defini definitions or keywords or whatever this is. I don't really know. And actually, I I, I learned the other day that uh, Upstream is working on a modern, more dynamic list based language. When I found that, uh, I think I like M for more than before. So this is how it works uh, with, uh, with makefile, uh, for uh, the default makefile. It will expand. M4 is just like RPM, an expanding language. It's macro language. So it expands, expands uh, to uh, what we call a S Linux language, you know, the final version or final you know, file. And that is stored in the TMP, T TMP your project name TMP file. If you have a syntax error, and believe me, you will have a, a lot of syntax error when you start with that, at, at least that was my, my case, SLinux, uh, or I don't, I'm not sure if this is SLinux or M4, will tell you exactly your uh, TE file and line, line number, which is great, so you can fix it easily. On the other hand, there are some cases, uh, I think this was with the older versions or something, uh, when you don't see a line number of your TE file, but what you get is line number of the TMP expanded file. I was like, what, 10,000? Jesus, but don't be shy to open it. it. It just contains a lot of uh, empty lines, a lot of comments, but you eventually find your bug there, you know, uh, and you can easily fix the TE file there. Here's another tip. Uh, we will see uh, that some lines end with a semicolon, some are not. The golden rule here is this S Linux syntax itself, uh, and those are the lines that start with type or allow, and then that, I think this is pretty much it for our talk. Uh, must end up with semicolons, but the, all the other one must not. If you, you know, do it the other way around, it won't work. So you just need to remember that everything starts with, that starts with allow or type, usually you, you need to have a semicolon there. Okay, interface naming is an interesting tip. If you start with uh, SLinux, you will, you will soon, uh, sooner or later find out that you're not writing allow rules. You're actually writing uh, in, against interfaces. You're adding a, a lot of those interfaces, you know. Um, those are like functions, right? And the naming convention here is that I think 90% of the core policy follows that uh, uh, rule. It starts with, the, in this case, files, which, uh, which represents a file which this interface was defined in. In this case, files if, so we can easily find it. Then, uh, that, then it's the permission, read, append, or something. Underscore user files uh, is the last bit, which is the a little bit free form, I would say, subject. And you, you, you get used to it very soon. This, I already know that this represents slash user, so user files represents slash user. And so let's take a look on the M4 syntax. You already noticed the, uh, the quotes. It starts with the back quote, ends with the normal single quote. 
And every time you uh, need to use a type, you either need to declare it using you know, type something, or you need to require it. For this, uh, Silings utilizes a require keyword, but don't ask me why. The good practice is used to gen require. This is for, I think, for the optional box or something. It eventually expands to require, but every time you want to require a type, you use this macro gen require, and you'll be safe. Otherwise, you'll get some strange error, and you'll be finding this in the TMP file, the long one. And then we see that the, the, you know, the syntax is you know, quite, uh, you can get familiar with it in a minute. Uh, this is interface takes one parameter, that's the dollar one, and it basically allows to list, the, the, the first rule allow, means that allow the first parameter, which will be usually a domain, to list files or directories which are uh, you know, type with, uh, with the user T. And then, the, by the way, list their permis permission is not an interface, it's a support type. And the same for read uh, patterns there. And then we have uh, two support types that gives those allow rules. Let's take a look how it works. This is a support type. You can see that support types are defined with a define keyword or whatever this is, and not with the interface or macro. And this one expands to list of permissions. They eventually map to uh, system calls. I'm not sure if all the permissions map to system calls, uh, perhaps not, but doesn't matter in this case. Uh, and here we see uh, two examples of three parameters, support types. As you can see, they expand eventually to a macro. Again, they make use of su other support types. So you, usually the expanding level is quite high in S Linux, but you know, it's obvious from the name, so you don't need to know every single allow rule in your policy. You just need to know that the read files pattern gives you what you need. Uh, last week, this nice book was published, and I highly encourage you to download it, uh, sorry, to, to buy a copy. And if you, if you don't, <laughs> you can download it online, of course. And if you even don't do that, you can go and f download for free uh, examples from this book. And the, the examples zip, I think, contains function.sh, which gives you four nice little functions. And uh, you can include it in your shell environment. These are shell functions. SE shows something and finds something. And the SE show interface or definition, that's uh, definition means for support type, is great because it will you know, show you the whole you know, body of the interface or, or support type, which is great. But what I find even more useful is another tip. Uh, use SE find interface to find for occurrences of the you know, interface you're looking for. And with this, you can easily find interface itself, the definition, the declaration, but as well as the things, the, the usage from contrib subdirectory. So maybe you're you know, looking for uh, Apache Tomcat uh, or Tomcat domain template, which is a you know, template interface you'll, you'll be using for you know, creating your own policies for your applications. You can see if there is a use case in the co core policy, uh, and then you can copy it and change it. So you don't really need to start from scratch. If you're uh, using uh, tags uh, with your editor, uh, keep in mind that C tags doesn't support SLinux uh, natively, but there's this hack that was published years ago on the SLinux mailing list uh, that gives you, you know, a working text file and it works great. I'm using that uh, every day. Uh, and if you're a happy Vim user, you can download my package, which contains this script, the macro for that pending, and, and slightly improved M4 S Linux uh, syntax highlighting, I guess. was great. Uh, I think this works both for Wim and Emacs. If you have a text file, it, it will get you auto completion automatically, just for free. So it, it, maybe you you're, you're, you're want to add a rule to connect to SSH port, and you are not sure where, where this would be. So you start with Core Network, because you already know that Core Network interface con contains all the, you know, or most of, in of the interfaces that uh, has something to do with uh, network, and you, you know, type Control N in Vim, and you have it. Okay. If a Linux uh, uh, experience a misbehavior, the end result is if it's running in enforcing, uh, it, it will block the action, the action and uh, send a denial to the lock. If it's running uh, in a permissive mode, that will, you know, it, it won't block the program from doing that action, but it still will uh, give you an audit lock. 
audit log is, or denial log, is something you can find it on the Red Hat system in audit log. And it has this tag AVC, which stands for some vector cache or something. Uh, the most important thing is you know, the anatomy of, of this. So you find a name bind, this is the permission, which maps to a bind uh, syscall eventually. And then we see pit, we see a process name without parameters. We see source context and target context. So again, we are skipping user roles and S0, we're not you know, interested in this. We see that the passenger T is the domain, the, the, the application that was running in passenger T tried to bind UDP socket that was from the unreserved port range. And SLNs did the job for us already and extracted the, uh, the source port, which is in this case 1251. So we all, we, now we know, know that this you know, program is trying to bind the UDP. So it turned out this is for the DNS, you know, uh, DNS resolve. Uh, here's another tip. If you want to you know, know if there are any denials, and maybe you want to file a bugzilla, use audit search MAVC, which gives you the exact line uh, that it was shown uh, with the grep one, but it will show you uh, also the syscall, which is, was associated with this denial. In this case, it's not that useful because the uh, in interesting things are under the uh, struct uh, pointer there, and uh, SLNs already extracted that for us, but, but sometimes you get uh, a lot of uh, useful information in there. Here's a wonderful tool called audit to allow which can turn audit denials into uh, you know, allow rules. It's awesome. Uh, the first case you know, generates all our allow rules for all your, all your denials from the, uh, from the point the policy was reloaded. The dash R gives you also, tries to make use of uh, interfaces when appropriate. And uh, you can use, a, here's a tip, you can use a standard input to if you, if you, if you copy and paste it from Bugzilla or something, it works uh, mm -hmm. as well. And the uh, last one is if you do a dash capital M, uh, you, it will generate and compile a policy for you so you can have a quick fix. Now, when I first learned about audit to allow, uh, I thought like, okay, my work is done, I'm done. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm going to put my server into permissive mode, that's what I'm gonna do. Second, I will run our test suite, and that will run an hour and do everything possible with my application, and I will end up with many rules, and, then, and I'm, I, can get, I, I, I can get come in there and I'm, I'm, you know, grab a coffee or something. Well, it turned out, that this is not the right way to do this. Of course, I failed. Okay, first of all, as I showed you, you need to have some file context. You need to get, uh, you need to do the initial transition. If you want to uh, have this set up already, you end up with the garbage. It, useless, it's not working at all. Even if you create those, if you create the, uh, the blog, the, the declaration blog, and create a file context and set it and restart the application, you're actually not doing great because the, the bugs I've told you, uh, the, the file descriptors and uh, all the stuff, uh, you can't actually find, the, find them because in permissive mode, the action won't be denied. So file you know, will be open, for example, so the application will never g run the issue. It will never sec folder something. And you're not following the least privilege, privilege principle. Nobody does today firewalling, like opening firewall, then running all the applications and marking all the ports that were used, and then you know, turning it off and you know, only opening or cl closing the other ones and keeping uh, those which were used open, which is not a correct way to do this. So what I like to say, is the policy itself is not the only artifact that you're getting from this uh, workflow. It's, it's not more important, but it's as important as the policy itself, and that's the process, which you can imagine like an audit, audit of your source code. When you hire someone to audit your source code, he will eventually find some bugs. But with SLinux, uh, you know, writing a policy properly, you're doing audit of behavior of the program, which is great because that's very different from audit of the source code. You're auditing, you know, the behavior, and you're about to uh, find things like misconfiguration, bugs, or design issues. Examples: Maybe the program is reading a SSL key fi file for some reason, but it shouldn't. It 
it could be some you know, security flow to have this key in the memory. Why? It, it doesn't use it, so it's a bug. Maybe there is a misconfiguration. The program is supposed to connect to Postgres instance using local sockets by default, but for some reason it's connecting via TCP, which is a you know, performance issue, could be. And you, you can find easily those bugs and misconfigurations and fix them. You're not going to add a rule in your policy. You're going to fix the software itself, file a bug, and discuss this with developers. So keep in mind that writing a policy is like audit. You're making your software better. It's not only about the policy and getting those advantages. So, and this is not out of my head. This is, you know, how you should write policy. It's well known that it's good to take small steps. Run your uh, SLUs in enforcing. Uh, well, you can, you should always run in enforcing, right? But for in the de development, uh, don't do permissive. Do the first initial transitions and, and file labels, and then uh, modify, compile the policy, load it, and start your program. It will crash eventually in a minute or in the second. Well, not trying to load an ATC slash my app slash configuration file because there's no rule. Uh, remember that if there's no rule, there's no way it won't work. So add your line, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe go into, into the source code, check if everything's correct, and repeat. Do this over and over again until you have a working, uh, working uh, policy and you'll uh, you know, take advantage of all these good, good things. Here's another tip. I've been pretty bad in this uh, last year. Um, every single comment in Git when you have a stable policy and you're improving it because uh, it's not about a bugs in your policy. It's also a bug because the software itself changes, you know, and then it maybe it now bins another port or something. Uh, always include uh, a denial with the commit message and the syscall as well. It's not, it's not here in this example because I can tell you in four, three years, you won't be able to tell each particular line w why the, you know, rule is there. So, and the uh, syscall and AVC line will tell you a lot of information. Now, this is a nice one, not a technical one. Uh, when we, we were discussing how to approach this within our Red Hat, Red Hat you know, uh, I'm from a satellite six, uh, there was a, an idea, the idea that someone from SLINUX team could write a policy for, for us because they know SLINUX well, right? Uh, but um, it proved that uh, even if someone with a great SLINX knowledge uh, would write a policy for your software, if that software is complex enough, and we're talking about Satellite 6 or OpenStack, you know, that, that compose, compose of, uh, composition of uh, like tens, maybe tens of, of open source components, then learning steep of uh, SLINX is much steeper than the, some projects. So you'll eventually, we, we would, eventually end up with a loop of many questions. Does this program need to read this file? What this cache directory is for? Do we allow a write or not allow? So we took um, a different extreme. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, we've, we've been trained and tried try out on our own. And it turned, uh, it turned out that it worked. Now we are two with some SNNUS knowledge in the team, and we review you know, our patches each other. I highly encourage you to do the reviews because even it looks like easy, you know, it's just a bunch of rules. You can do a box, you can do, uh, we're dealing with security, so you always want to be sure. And only in the case when you're not sure, because there are some hidden secrets, hidden dragons uh, here and there, you can always ask on the list, and guys are pretty responsive and helpful, so, uh, and you can al al also, what we do is we ask them for a review. If we are not sure about the patch, they will uh, mm, review the patch for us and find the flaws and, and possible bugs. Uh, here's a tip. If you need to deal with the multiple versions like RHEL 765, and, and guys usually change the interface names. And if you, the, the, the one way of, of you know, work around, work, work around with this is to, get, to do a git branch, but if your policy is 100 lines uh, long and you need just to three or four lines, you can take uh, usage of, uh, take, take, uh, leverage the distro flag variable that comes with the make file, with the default one. And if you set it, it won't be set automatically. This, this was the snag that I've been fighting for an hour. Uh, but if you set it uh, manually, then you can use uh, if def or if def macros to 
actually branch your code. So you don't need really to make it branch or something. Okay? Now deployment in, in question. There are multiple ways of deploying uh, SLA poli SLA uh, policies. Uh, if the software you're writing policy for is already in RHEL or Fedora, you can send patch to SC Linux core policy, which now is by hosted in, on GitHub, I think, from, from the last year. And eventually it will be included. It's, it's uh, good enough. The other extreme is if your software is installed from third party repo, like Foreman, uh, which I'm working on, we, you need to ship your policy. Shipping a policy is really all about uh, um, you know, copying a PP file and then uh, loading it uh, in. The proper way, of course, uh, we are Red Hat, is using RPM packages. So we have an RPM package. We adopted, ad adopted an approach from Spacewalk project here and slightly improved that. Uh, we have an enable script, which uh, loads the policy uh, and sets some booleans and, and ports. Uh, we're, th there's a hack to, because uh, all the S Every single SC manage, manage command is slow, so we, we're using a temp file to do some things in one transaction. Then we have a reliable script, which relabels using restorecon. It will relabel all the files, which are we are interested in, to the default file context you've, you've already defined in your policy. And we don't, we won't use, uh, we want, uh, we don't want to use a slash because that would be slow. So we only reliable those directories we are interested in. And then you have spec, which is uh, easy. Uh, first of all, we need to determine uh, rel, if it's uh, rel or Fedora. We do support rel or Fedora for SL Linux currently. And then we call just uh, make, uh, which was slightly improved in our case, which does installation for us and uh, several other things. Uh, and and th here there is a uh, post or scriptlets which do enable or disable or reliable uh, uh, depending on if you're installing, upgrading, uninstalling stuff. And we're, you know, shipping a policy is really a copying a PP file. In this case, it's bzip, bzip uh, compressed by, you don't need to compress it. And then you can ship, it's a good idea to ship the source code as well with a binary package. Okay. Okay, be prepared, brace yourself because if you're doing SC Linux, you won't be perhaps a rock star within your team because it's usually not a product feature, the top three product feature because with in Red Hat is there's, a, there's this rule we always ship with SC Linux. On the other hand, I, which I particularly like is if you need to clean your head, the SC Linux is great, you know, exit. I would say you can, all, there will be always some bugs uh, on the SC Linux uh, um, uh, component in bugs, not, not because your policy is maybe you know, uh, bad, but uh, stems from the fact that the product uh, or pro projects are changing. So you need to align the policy. So it's a good, you know, um, uh, way to have a break. Okay, we are just on time. One more thing. If you just about, if you want to remember just one thing from this slide deck, please uh, remember this one. Uh, if, you ab uh, if you're going to file a Linux bug, Please always attach a list of denials, and please do use audit search MAVC, which gives us a, a, a lot of more in, uh, useful information. Uh, if you can, please uh, do restore con RVN slash, which gives us a list of files which are mislabeled, which is uh, always a good help. And if you want to be a rock star, then uh, do a P, PS uh, capital Z, which uh, you know uh, ships. Uh, list of processes with their domains, which is great stuff to have, All right? Remember, denials, files, processes. Okay, um, just in the time, questions. Yes. So the question was uh, writing a policy, and 
you know, uh, there were no denials, but the software was not yet, you know, working. Like with uh, mode, it was yeah, okay. Sure, it happened to me as well. And I, I asked Esselinux guys, and they provided me an answer. Uh, that was because uh, there are some rules that are turned off. Uh, we, they call them don't audit, I think. And what you need to do is you, you, you can switch uh, Linux to ignore don't audit rules. Instead of allow, you can do don't audit, or something like that. And the rule will, the, the rule, uh, will be blocked, but it won't be locked. And maybe you were hitting some kind of this issue. So what you, what you need to do is se manage dash, I think, capital B, which will turn off those no, don't audit uh, rules. And then you'll see what happened. It might help. Other questions? OK. Mm -hmm. So hopefully most of the demos and servers are not using the old configuration style and etc. But this is still with uh, they are still in the SE Linux policy. Are there any uh, uh, any plans to clean this building? Sorry, are there any plans to clean in regard to the system D? Yeah, I, I have to say I don't know. I'm not from S Linux. I was just writing a policy for our project. I, I guess guys are working on improvements every day. So yeah, eventually there will be some improvements. I'm sorry, can't tell you. Anything else? Please come, come over to me if you have uh, more questions. Thank you.